There are three particularly interesting papers that are out on Archive right now, and Archive is a preprint server, so these have not been formally accepted. However, they are very interesting to me, and I noticed that they weren't getting any traction, so I am here to remedy that situation. So today I'm going to cover three papers that uh, appear on Archive. The first one is collective, or sorry, conversational swarm intelligence, CSI. Uh, the second one is about theory of mind and their emergence in LLMs. We've actually finally got some uh, empirical evidence about how and why theory of mind is modeled in large language models. And then finally, a paper on proposing a new cognitive architecture for autonomous agents. So first, CSI, conversational swarm intelligence. Uh, this is a paper, it was a relatively small experiment. They had 25 people broken out into five chat rooms and they used ChatGPT 3.5 to basically summarize and transmit the ideas from one chat room to another uh, once a minute. Now, this uh, basically formed a little bridge between these five different chat rooms, uh, but the, the result was actually relatively impactful for a, for a somewhat low bandwidth kind of summary and transmission of ideas to propagate across this, uh, this very relatively small information network. Uh, there was 30% more contributions and then 7% less variance. So why is this significant? So if contributions go up by a third, that means that people are more engaged while they're problem solving. And so taking a big step back, what, like, so what, why? Well, imagine you're on Discord and you've got a whole bunch of different channels and people are all kind of scattered all over the place and there's conversations happening in different channels and different Discord servers and you need to coordinate. This is the kind of thing that a lot of us who are users of Slack Discord and Microsoft Teams and pretty much any other chat platform wish that we could have because what this does is it is in real time, it surfaces the primary uh, like insights and decisions that are being uh, created as people converse and then propagates that across uh, a network. And so this, uh, some of the advantages of this method is that it's really, really simple. They use ChatGPT 3.5, which is cheap and fast in order to propagate these signals, these information across uh, networks. So how is this going to play out? Why do I think that this is significant? Uh, the biggest reason that I think that this is significant is because as the information landscape out there uh, accelerates and we have more internet saturation, more internet penetration, and more conversations, we need ways of coordinating massive uh, like efforts, whether it's uh, coordinating open source, planning with inside companies, uh, or even just on social media, uh, discussing social issues, discussing policy issues, that sort of thing. I think that this technology will fundamentally offer us new ways to disseminate information and to get up to speed and share ideas and also magnify good ideas. Because imagine it this way. Imagine that there is a Discord server or subreddit or whatever where people are uh, you know, workshopping ideas about like how do we implement UBI or how do we solve climate change or whatever. The good ideas that originate in one server are going to be automatically propagated to other servers or other chat rooms uh, where they can be discussed and added. And so it basically destroys the echo chamber entirely, but it's it, it destroys the echo chamber by mediating that conversation by simply just saying, hey, this other group, you know, it's not personal, just this other group had this idea, what do you think of it, let's add it to your conversation. And so by constantly cross-pollinating between these chat rooms, these echo chambers, you can break down those uh, intellectual barriers and those emotional barriers in order to have better conversations. Now, this was a relatively small experiment, but I think that uh, I think that you'll probably actually see even greater impacts with larger groups and more sophisticated approaches. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that this uh, study is uh, done in part by Carnegie Mellon University. So these are serious people, uh, serious researchers uh, promoting this idea. So next up we have, this is the big one. So this one, as soon as I saw this, I was like, okay, whatever. This is nothing new. But then I got to reading it, and they started referring to this thing called artificial neurons. Okay, so taking one big step back, what is theory of mind? Theory of mind is the human ability to model what is going on in someone else's mind. We have the ability to keep track of the contents, beliefs, and state of someone else's brain. And so uh, obviously theory of mind, it doesn't work best over text. 
However, uh, it is more of a longitudinal or it has a temporal component, meaning that the longer you interact with someone, the more you can gauge kind of what they believe, what's going on in their head, so on and so forth. So what this paper does is they talked about uh, applying theory of mind tests that are used on humans. So human-based theory of mind tests to a variety of language models, including Falcon and Llama and a few others, uh, in order to see, to one, measure their performance, which you can see by this graph, none of them perform as well as humans yet, which, okay, that's not what we're measuring here. We're not, we're not trying to compare their performance to human performance. We're trying to characterize how these language models have theory of mind. And these are relatively small models. We have 40 billion parameter models and 13 billion uh, parameter models. So these are very small. Um, and they're still demonstrating some theory of mind. Now, the most interesting thing to me is that this emergence of what they call artificial neurons or selective embeddings. And so basically what this is, and this was actually a little bit harder to believe because there's been rumors you know, from the neuroscience and AI community for actually several years that there's often some convergence between the way that uh, deep neural networks process information and the way that um, some very small circuits in the human brain process information. And so we usually see that more in visual processing. So for instance, in uh, all the language models, uh, image detection and object recognition, the way that those surface features, um, such as edges and colors and shapes, is actually really similar to how the optic nerve in the human uh, brain processes uh, and, and, and breaks down images. But that's, okay, that, that kind of makes sense, right? You know, you know human, human eyes, human brains, through the process of evolution, our optic nerve is going to find the most efficient way of decomposing images that we take in. Likewise, you have the same problem space of image decomposition, you train a neural network to do the same thing with the same kinds of data, maybe you're going to have some convergence in the way that they process. And of course, of course, I'm, I'm not saying that it like it created a virtual optic nerve. That's what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that um, kind of what the circuits do uh, at an emergent level, what they do mathematically to that information is there is some convergence. Now, this is an entirely new domain. Because it's one thing to process image data. It's another thing to process beliefs. <laughs> what is a belief? How can you represent a belief math mathematically? And what this paper does, and this is the part that is just, it's, it's still kind of blowing my mind. What this paper does is it shows that there are these emergent neural circuits or these selective embeddings that specifically pay attention to true beliefs and false beliefs and whether or not the information in question being asked pertains to a true or false belief. And what they furthermore say, and these, <laughs> again, I want to point out who is uh, promoting this. This is Harvard. This is MIT. This is, um, <laughs> this is the Health Sciences and Technology Department. This is the Medical School and Program of Neuroscience. So uh, it's one thing if I say, hey, there's some convergence between artificial neural networks and organic neural networks. It's an entirely different thing if Harvard neuroscience says that there's some convergence. And so this is why I'm like visibly excited because this is something that I've been thinking about for a while. What is the nature of superintelligence once it emerges? And one thing that a lot of people are really skeptical of and hostile about is saying, uh, well, we have no idea how superintelligence is going to work. It's going to be completely alien. Um, it's going to basically be like talking to, you know, the, there's just going to be no similarity between the way that we process information and our goals. And, you know, I'm not sure that I believe that. I I I personally think that uh, that there are one probably diminishing returns because uh, think about think of it this way: the human brain is 30 percent smaller than the Neanderthal, the Neanderthal brain, but we are objectively smarter than the Neanderthals were based on the sophistication of our art and artifacts that they left behind. Uh, and so, it's size isn't always everything. Now, these are still very tiny models in the grand scheme of things, so they haven't quite gotten up to the optimal size. But at the same time, there's probably going to be diminishing returns in terms of intelligence. Once you have the, the raw materials of intelligence, the raw machines, you can do more of it. You can do it faster. But there's probably limits to the, to the way that information is processed in the brain. Now, that being said, there's obviously a huge variance between humans. There are some humans that can do calculus at light speed. There are others that cannot do calculus at all, uh, and so on and so forth. So we should still expect to see uh, superhuman abilities emerge. But 
The point here is that from a mathematical perspective, we're all universal Turing machines. We're all dealing in the same realm of physics with the same underpinning laws of physics, matter, and energy allowing us to do these computations. And so basically the, the takeaway here is that maybe the human brain already found some of the most efficient ways to do processing. And so what we're seeing here is the first evidence that neural networks, artificial neural networks, are converging on processing theory of mind in a similar way that human brains do. So the net re result might be that AI thinks more similarly to us than we realize, or at least has some of the same underpinning neural capabilities. Now, obviously, we can reshape artificial neural networks any way that we want. We can slice them and dice them and recombine them in, in ways and structure them in ways that, that is not possible for human brains. But then again, the human brain has a lot of plasticity and literally quadrillions of connections inside of it that can create virtual circuits on the fly. So it remains to be seen. Obviously, don't read too much into this. This is a very early uh, study, but I've seen this trend for several years now. I used to uh, listen to this podcast called uh, Neuro Inspired um, or Brain Inspired. Anyways, they talked about this kind of thing uh, for the last five five years or so. And then finally, the last paper that I want to cover today is the Koala paper, the Cognitive Architectures for Language Agents paper. Now, uh, the reason that I wanted to cite this paper is because, one, it came from Princeton, so another uh, Ivy League uh, aside from Harvard. But another thing that, it, that this paper does really well is it introduces all the background of cognitive architecture and gives you some of the, the, the ground rules, the how and why of cognitive architecture and the history of cognitive architecture. And so this is, of course, something that I've talked about for a long time. I've written three books on cognitive architecture now. and But this is a little bit more validation and vindication from the academic establishment. And you'll notice that the, uh, the cognitive architectural diagram they have here is basically the same as the SOAR cognitive architecture, which has been around since, what, the 70s, 80s is when it was really kind of being worked on. Um, so the book that I wrote, uh, Symphony of Thought and Natural Language Cognitive Architecture, both propose more sophisticated cognitive architectures, or at least some cognitive architectural paradigms. Um, so this paper doesn't add too much, but if you're not familiar with cognitive architectures, it's a really great entry point. So that's why I wanted to share this one. Um, and they have a very linear kind of process here. Observation, proposal, evaluation, selection, execution. That's great. It's a relatively simple linear thing. Um, there's a few things missing from this. Namely, this paper does not address ethics, morality, or even really decision-making frameworks. So you can create an autonomous agent with what purpose, what mission. Um, they don't really talk about how to deeply integrate that into the design. This is more of a general purpose, slightly biomimetic cognitive architecture. So I'm not particularly personally impressed, but I'm glad that this paper exists to bring more of the conversation uh, at a high level into the space of cognitive architecture and large language models and autonomous agents. Okay, so those are the three papers. Let's just do a quick recap and as we wrap it up for the day. Um, so CSI, the, uh, the, the swarm intelligence, uh, this is going to be really useful, I think, for open source, science, policy, and consensus. What I'm really looking forward to is the CSI paper to be integrated as a feature into Microsoft Teams and Slack and Discord, where you can just say, hey, automatically surface the main points uh, you know, as these threads go and share those points with the rest of the, of the community. Now, again, this is something that's relatively simple. As long as you have API access to ChatGPT and Discord, you can implement this today. Uh, and it's, it's super simple. It's just on a minute by minute basis or on a regular time basis, you take a roll up, you summarize kind of the key points that are being discussed and you share it to the most relevant nearby groups. Super brain dead simple. There's all kinds of ways you can make it more sophisticated and more complicated, but the fact that, um, you can get such good results with a, such a simple algorithm, uh, is really encouraging. Number two, theory of mind and artificial, uh, neurons. This is really profound evidence of neural convergence, which I think is going to be a really big topic um, as we approach AGI and superintelligence. We might discover that human brains are already the most efficient way, and so that as machines get more and more intelligent, they actually become more like us. So, uh, you know, there's, there's instrumental convergence that Nick, Nick Bostrom uh, proposed that maybe as uh, AI becomes more autonomous, there's going to be several goals that all AI converge on, which 
when you take a step back, it's like all AI is going to want resources. Well, all humans want resources. All AI is going to want to self-preserve. Okay, all humans want to self-preserve. So basically, like <laughs> as more time goes by, I'm less and less impressed by uh, by Nick Bostrom's work. And I know that that's like, okay, you know, I'll probably catch some flack for that. But if you look at an uh, at a machine as a, an agent in the realm of physics and energy, yes, it's going to have some same uh, some similar uh, needs as us. Now, what I'm talking about here, though, is not just from the matter of energy and material. What I'm talking about is the way that it processes information, and perhaps you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe, a few billion years of evolution has already discovered the most energetic. Uh, method of achieving some of these things. And so I anticipate we will probably see a little bit more convergence. But like I said, it's not it's not that it's functionally or physically processing in the same way, but rather some of the transformations that are happening to the information and the way that it's the way that the neural networks, the artificial neural networks are treating the information that flows through them is similar enough to some of the ways that uh, various uh, brain circuits, organic circuits treat information. If this continues, this will have massive, massive implications for the way that uh, we think of superintelligence and artificial intelligence moving forward. Now, again, this even as a as an IT guy, as a software engineer, as an architect, I will say that okay, great. Even if on a on a you know microscopic level, you look at a model under a microscope, it does some things similar to the human brain. That in no way says that that they're going to be agentic, just like us. That they're going to have a sense of self preservation, just like us. That they're going to have the same goals and morals and values as us. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm saying is that the way that they process information, the cognitive tools that are emerging in uh, artificial neural networks are similar enough to us that maybe there's a possibility that um, that that we will actually be able to understand each other uh, for the foreseeable future. It's also entirely possible that they will evolve entirely new cognitive machinery that we just don't comprehend, that they will come up with novel information processing schemes that our brains are just not capable uh, of intuitively understanding. So one example could be um, uh, could be exponentials. No matter how much training you have, human brains are just simply not equipped to intuitively grasp exponentials. We live in a geometric world, and so we're able to throw footballs back and forth. We're able to, you know, kind of anticipate where something is going to land if you throw it or if it's dropped. Uh, but if you look at an exponentially changing thing, your brain just does not have the neural uh, machinery to uh, to understand that or to intuitively grasp it, no matter how much experience and training you have. Uh, and so in that respect, it's entirely possible that artificial neural networks will continue to evolve in that direction where they will be able to understand things because of the underlying neural machinery that they possess or that they're able to emerge to surface in their training regimen than we, that we just are not capable of. I don't know. It remains to be seen because, again, there's a huge amount of plasticity in the human brain, and it would be incredibly premature to assume that uh, machines that – Super inefficient machines are capable of even forming circuitry that our brains are not already capable of and possibly have already mastered. Now, either assertion requires evidence, so it remains to be seen. And then finally, a quick recap of the Koala paper. It's relatively simp simplistic take on cognitive architecture, but again, my biggest takeaway is I'm glad that more people are talking about cognitive architecture in the context of large language models and agentic frameworks, because like it or not, uh, autonomous AI is coming, and one thing that I want to point out is that in the next few weeks, my paper on the autonomous cognitive entity framework, the ACE framework, is going to be uh, finished and published, and uh, this is going to knock your socks off. So stay tuned, and uh, thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Cheers, thanks, and have a good rest of your day.